So we started looking at places on Earth that could somehow teach us a little bit about how to live on Mars. So this is uh, in Tunisia, uh, what looks like a lifeless desert from, uh, from the sky. When you start diving in, you realize that it's actually a dense uh, uh, village. Uh, it's full of houses that have been dug into the ground. And basically they've been dug in to exploit the thermal mass of, uh, of the soil to keep steady temperatures. So it's very cold nights, it's very warm days. It has a blazing sun. So you have the shade uh, and you have the thermal mass that creates a, a, a nice livable uh, space. Uh, we went to the Canyonlands in Arizona. Again, what looks like a, a desert landscape. When you look closer, uh, the big cliff walls have actually become the canopy uh, for, for large civilizations where people were living under the shade of the rocks above, protecting them from the, from the elements. And finally, of course, it's quite cold on Mars. Uh, Greenland, uh, the Arctic, uh, sort of using um, the insulating uh, ability of, of snow and ice because uh, when water freezes, it captures air bubbles so it actually works as insulation. Uh, also, the geometry of the, uh, of the, of the ground cave or the igloo uh, is a spherical, of course, because of, uh, it's built with pressure, but also it has an optimum relation between contained volume and surface. So we thought, what would a Martian vernacular look like? And of course, to begin with, we have to arrive with a, a, a habitat module uh, that we have manufactured at home. But then we have to somehow try to, a building is very heavy, so we can't schlep tons of, of building material from Earth. So we have to bring small machines with which we can build buildings. And then eventually we should bring nothing, we should create an ecosystem. Uh, we have to create a, a man-made, uh, self-sustained ecosystem. So this is what one human consumes per day, two liters of water uh, and X amount of carbohydrates, fat, proteins, and some fiber. Uh, the only way to supply this in a sustainable way is by becoming vegetarian. Um, so we have to do that. Uh, then what we need to do is we need to combine uh, the sort of uh, ecosystem capable of sustaining plants with the ecosystem capable of sustaining humans into one integrated ecosystem. And if we just look at what we have, so on Mars, we have regolith. It's the, it's, the, uh, it's the soil or the ground. It's no soil, it's really just ground. It's called regolith. It consists of meteorites, basalt, and some sands. Um, if we start sorting it, uh, uh, we can get some, uh, f uh, some, uh, some ice that, of course, we can uh, make water. Uh, basalt stones, sands. With the sand and the water, we can actually create bricks. Uh, we can create uh, Martian concrete, we can create ceramics. Um, we can also start sorting the sand. It consists of silicia, aluminum, and iron oxide. Um, so we can make uh, uh, aluminum, we can make glass, uh, we can make electronics, uh, and with that we can make photovoltaics. Uh, so we can start producing power. Um, with electricity and water, we can make electrolysis that splits water molecules into oxygen and hydrogen. Uh, combined with the atmosphere of, CO, uh, uh, of Mars, it's 93% CO2. We can create, uh, with the Sabache reactor, we can create methane and we get oxygen uh, as a byproduct. Uh, so we can actually use that to make a rocket propellant so we can fly home um, if we want to. Uh, a byproduct is more water uh, and some carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide and iron ore create steel. Uh, and we can also uh, create uh, plastics, uh, hard plastics, soft plastics. Of course, we're going to recycle everything because we need to, because all the resources are going to be very precious. Uh, and we can make transparent plastics so we can make inflatable membranes. So we can make greenhouses uh, where we can plant plants, uh, root zones for biotreatment, so we can actually clean the water we have, uh, aeroponics, aquaponics, uh, hydroponics food, and finally we can sustain human life. So using only ingredients on Mars, we can actually create a self-propelling circular economy and an ecosystem. Uh, we're going to have to shrink our spatial needs a little bit to begin with, um, to roughly a, a third of what we have here. And then there's the radiation. Just on Mars you get 110 MSV of radiation. Um, 
Just by comparison, uh, a radiologist would get 50 in a year. <laughs> Airline crew would get 20. That's sort of the upper level. At sea level, you only have three. Uh, but we found out that a typical American only spends 7.6% of their day outdoor. If we say we only spent 18% of our day uh, above the ground, we can get our so four, four hours a day uh, in, the, in the complete exposure. Uh, we get only 18 MSV, that's the same as the cabin crew. Uh, but of course, instead of having indoor or outdoor, we need to have more gradients. Uh, so we started looking at what are, the, what are the sort of habitats we can look at. Inflatables make a lot of sense because you can capture air, you can keep pressure, but it won't protect you from meteors and it won't protect you um, from radiation. 3D printed structures are smart because you use the local regolith as a kind of cementitious fabric to, to build buildings with very small machinery. Uh, they, they will have more protection from, uh, uh, from meteors, but, uh, but, but insufficient. Uh, they won't be tight enough, uh, so they'll leak uh, and they won't protect you from the radiation. And finally, excavation will give you full protection uh, uh, from, uh, from radiation. It won't be, it probably will leak uh, uh, some and also uh, you won't have any daylight. Um, so let's say none of the alternatives function on their own, but combined, you actually get what you need. Imagine creating an inflatable membrane, then you start construction inside the pressurized environment. You excavate uh, and you start using the excavated material to print. Uh, and then you basically get this sort of, where every day you have to make sure that you spend the right amount of time in the different zones. Uh, and, and this sort of logic, you can then sort of start creating uh, larger and larger habitats connected above ground, below ground. Uh, and as you get bigger and bigger, you can imagine like a main street uh, connected into almost like a city network. Uh, so, so that's how we sort of imagine this sort of progression uh, over the next uh, years. So, so the goal uh, for this project is to have a habit, uh, an inhabited city uh, on Mars with a thousand people in, uh, in 2117. Um, so even for an architect, that's a little slow. Uh, so uh, to test all the hypotheses, we'll, be, we'll start breaking ground uh, next year on uh, the Mass Science City in Dubai, in a piece of desert in a, in a big national park. Uh, we're gonna move all the palm trees inside uh, uh, the habitat so that everything really looks like Mars. Um, it's going to contain uh, exhibitions uh, and research and, uh, and university. Uh, it'll have like gardens where we test farming, where we have outdoor exhibits and where we test different technologies in, uh, in photovoltaics and, uh, 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 and, and sort of uh, ultra efficient agriculture. Um, this is what it's going to look like from the, from the outside. Inside, You'll have this sort of a, a forum about uh, interplanetary uh, architecture. What, one interesting thing, uh, when, you th when you 3D print, um, you know, when you build with plates, you know, uh, straight lines and the hard corners make more sense. When you 3D print, it's actually the amount of material and the amount of time. S uh, and also, like, rounded corners are less uh, brittle. So suddenly, we'll get a, a, a vocabulary that Living on Mars is not going to be living inside some kind of uh, metal box. It'll be like almost like this sort of new vernacular of these sort of exotic streets. Uh, we, you see the, the texture of the 3D printing. Another interesting thing is that the radiation, you need seven meters of uh, Martian regolith to protect you from radiation. But hydrogen, because it's so uh, uh, small and dense, is a very good shield and water has a lot of hydrogen. So one meter of water protects the same as seven meters of rock. So you can imagine the underground spaces will have these giant skylights where you might see fish that you will eventually eat swimming around, uh, uh, filtering uh, the radiation, but bringing daylight to the underground spaces. We'll, we'll recreate that in, uh, 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 in Dubai. You'll have the exhibits. And, and just like we imagine living in, uh, on Mars, you will combine living space with agricultural space because it's going to be lovely to be surrounded by greenery also for the, for the indoor climate, but also you need to be effective with space. So uh, it's going to be a very lush and green environment uh, 
you'll be able to sort of study the latest in ultra-efficient uh, agriculture in various ways. Um, and finally, we're going to design the membrane so that it can uh, regulate uh, uh, sun, so that just by uh, decreasing and increasing uh, the pressure, uh, you can sort of open and close, uh, so that something can both be a greenhouse, but also be a, a, a lecture hall. Um, so essentially, we hope to, um, uh, to break ground next year, to hope to open in, in, in four years, uh, as a sort of prototype of what will, be, will eventually be, be realized on, uh, on Mars. Uh, we actually, sort of, uh, as a study also for the Dubai Future Foundation, consolidating all our experiences to actually look at all of the planets in the solar system uh, to create this sort of architect's guide to the galaxy uh, that could be maybe uh, be like the Neufert of, uh, uh, of, of extraterrestrial architecture. <clears throat> so just to, uh, to sum up, and, and maybe one argument that I, that I find quite valid is that why spend all this energy on going to Mars when we have challenges on Earth? If you look at the 17 sustainable development goals of the United Nations that have just been ratified by 193 countries, Eight of them relate to the built environment. Um, you know, uh, drinking water. We actually have uh, 1.5 billion cubic meters of water on Earth. We only have five, cubic, uh, five million uh, cubic meters of, of, uh, of ice on Mars. So we have to be super efficient and really treat uh, water preciously. <clears throat> on Earth, we obviously have a lot of land. On Mars, we have to be 10 times more effective uh, with uh, the amount of space we use for agriculture. On, on Earth, one of the main sources of global warming is uh, fossil fuels. You have no fossil fuels on, on Mars, uh, so you will have to uh, uh, sort of uh, fuel yourself with uh, uh, renewable uh, energy. So in a way, all the challenges that we face on Earth, if we, if we become successful at, at living on Mars, those technologies, we can bring them back to Earth and, and become great custodians of Earth. And I think it has to do with perspective. A lot of astronauts claim, uh, and this is uh, the, the, the photo uh, Earth rise uh, from the Apollo 8 as it orbited around the moon. They saw uh, Earth rising over the surface of the moon. And, um, and all the astronauts say that it gives you a different perspective suddenly to see your own planet uh, from outside. Um, Sort of, I'm imagining that uh, uh, in uh, maybe a few decades, uh, maybe our children's generation are going to be standing on the planet that they now call home, looking at a big blue star on the sky. And this is basically what Earth looks like from Mars, as seen by the Curiosity uh, rover. Um, and sort of almost like Im imagining that the, the technologies and the discoveries they have made uh, by going from Earth to, to Mars is essentially also what now makes, uh, makes Earth uh, uh, a more sustainable and, uh, and more inhabitable planet. Uh, and as a sort of last thing, if you look at, at the red planet, you can imagine uh, over a, a period of one to 200 years, if we start releasing uh, uh, oxygen into the atmosphere, we start growing plants, this is what uh, Mars will look like uh, with liquid oceans and a, and a biosphere. Uh, and, and suddenly the difference between Mars and Earth is, uh, uh, is much smaller. So, um, and, and, I, and, and, maybe, and maybe to sort of to round it off, I think th there is something about architecture which is essentially that you can say as humans, we have uh, adapted, uh, you know, life has evolved on Earth by adapting to the environment. Um, the fish strands on the land and it starts moving around with its flippers and, and slowly develops legs. The monkey gets out of the jungle into the savanna and it suddenly stands on its back uh, legs, uh, liberating its front uh, uh, hands to actually manipulate stuff. And then we invent tools and technology and architecture. And suddenly we as humans, rather than life adapting to the surroundings, we get the power to adapt our surroundings to life. Um, it's almost an inversion of evolution uh, and I think the ultimate challenge of course is that uh, we now have the power to take good care or to destroy our own ecosystem and with that we also suddenly get the power to really migrate way beyond our origin in, uh, in East Africa. 
Um, and of course, with, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. And, um, and I think it's a responsibility and a possibility uh, that we have uh, as architects.